out after 12. Thank you so much for being here. It means a lot for us to have smiling faces looking out at us in the room. We are going to enjoy the next hour and a half in community conversation, looking at some issues around social cohesion, especially how it pertains to the arts. And in between our chatting away, we're also going to have some, some poetry, and we can just, we've just enjoyed some beautiful music from the Drakendale Girls Choir. So that was just nice to set the tone, very affirming, very beautiful. So thank you very much. I think let's start with some poetry. Let's, we're talking about art, let's perform our art. We'll talk about it after we've done our performance. So may I call up, please, our first participant? Tando. Tando Fosse is a Durban-based spoken word artist, writer, curator, and she's the author of Conversations with the Human. She's the founder of Fuse Art, a literary arts and performance company which prioritizes work by female artists. Her work explores topics around identity and individualism, sexuality and gender inequality. She looks at politics, which all follow a theme of love in different forms. Tando, the microphone's yours. Hello, hello everyone. How's everyone doing? Good, <laughs> good. Now that I know that everyone is here. Um, I'm not so good with the talking, so I'll just get to the poetry. In first grade, we learned the deep depression that women sink into. We learned that someone always knows about women's suffering knows when they disappear into the thick of silence or disappear for speaking up. But we were told that no one is coming to save the woman but herself. And I have a hard time. I have a hard time writing poems where women die between the lines. But that's where the world keeps placing us, ain't it? At the scene of the crime, being the scene of the crime, always in the line of fire, dying. On the sidelines of life, always flatlining, do you see how the world has turned us into endangered species? Warm-blooded mammals that once, bore, that once bore children, now barren with torn hymens, can't harvest, babies are miscarried. But women are expected to gather courage to bear more. For men who wear their manhood on their knuckles and claim to love more, it all makes it seem as though we were never treasured but traded for cattle and war, for chores and all we were trophies, way before the gold and now they belittle us in boardrooms too and claim to know more. Get paid more with their knees on our shoulders, don't you know? We've become their corporate letters. Constantly finding ways to cut off our tongue so we don't speak easy. We need to call seminars to mobilize, posting up collages of fallen women to make clear reference of our pain. Refer to certain pages for tips on self-defense, because cops, they don't defend us. Demand us discharge to prove the truth, then continue to molest us. Break our bones in hidden places to remain credible, so in the courts, it's still their word against ours. And for men, their word is bond, except for no, they say it sounds like yes, but no. There are no gray areas, just errors and broken bones and boundaries, but we know the world is male and men handles us with its cold hands and claims it equal. Demands us to post up and fight for what's ours as equals, but fight how with no gloves and hurdles in each corner. Fight how when they still treat us like both corner shops and mannequins, displays where many can touch us like cuff prized items, always trying to bargain with our bodies dictating how we should dress them, always scoping our bodies for defects so we can sell them in different districts to whoever is bidding, is it not enough? The true illicit hands have traveled our skins. Sometimes I wish our melanin was flammable to culpable groping hands, to set a light and set aside the sort of has-beens with sordid minds, set them ablaze at the stake and kill any odds to conjure lies, don't you know? We've started reclaiming our thrones. It's a takeover that's long overdue, but We've become leaders of our own homes. And while you've been churning and tilling the soil, you've been training mines, buying acres and founding mines, don't you know? We started the rain dance way before the fat lady sung. And you should know, all the hummingbirds still caged will soon sing and break chains. And when they do, they too will come for everything, starting with the world. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, 
Tando, that was beautiful and absolutely the perfect way to start today. So thank you so much for those words and those thoughts and those sentiments. It, it, it informs and frames what we're about to discuss. So thank you very much and perfect for a conversation around Women's Month. So thank you. Let's start talking a little bit. I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Ella Thompson. I'm a theatre publicist. And these days I also run a homeless book project whereby I have 10 homeless men who all earn their income from selling books. So my contribution to the conversation today is a little bit from really a, quite a different space, working with homeless men and reading incredible books. So I'm the facilitator and it's a real pleasure for me to be with you. With, be with you. I want to introduce the panelists that are sitting on stage. On my extreme right, with her dancing shoes on, is Lami Timbalani Masuku. She's a crafter and self-taught visual artist from Avoca Hills. Her grandmother taught arts and culture at a primary school. So as a child, she used to help her grandma prepare craft projects for the learners. This unlocked her passion for the arts, and she joined a youth program called Future Creators at the Bat Center, and also involved in this initiative for Courageous Women, which assisted women especially those living with disabilities, facing abuse, and living in poverty. We'd like to welcome Lamy on stage. <laughs> Next to me, Maeshni Naika, award-winning film, theater, TV, and radio actress, voiceover artist, brand ambassador, stage comedian, and MC. She won a Simon Sabella Film and Television Award for the best leading actress in the South African movie for her role in the Kandasami trilogy. She plays Shanti, the formal rival turned best friend to Jay Loshni Naidu's Jennifer in the Kandasami movie trilogy. She's done some really great other work, including starring alongside the fabulous Russell, Russell Peters as Constable Chima in the Canadian series called Indian Detective, which was shot in Cape Town. She's been in a horror film called The Curse of the Highway Sheila and a one-woman play called Salon Sue. She's an educator at the Maeshni Naika Academy of Speech and Drama. Welcome, Aishni. And the gentleman among all the roses is Carl Carvin Goldstone. Carvin is an internationally recognized South African comedian and respected journalist. He won the 2018 South African Comic of the Year and the 2018 Flying Solo Comedian of the Year and the 2020 South African Best Comedy Show for Life Stories streaming on Showmax. He has more than 15 years experience in journalism, 10 years in print with independent newspapers, where we were colleagues, and five years in broadcast journalism with ENCA. He has built and co-owns an online radio station managing 35 content creators and a streaming service. He runs a talent agency and is currently a Netflix content producer. Welcome, Carvin. So today we're going to try and begin to unpack the conversation around social cohesion. So if you look in the dictionary or on our faithful Wikipedia, social cohesion says it's defined as the willingness of a members of society to cooperate with each other in order to survive and prosper. It refers to the strength of relationships and the sense of solidarity among members of a community within and across group boundaries. So let's start by, with all of us, in a sentence or two, do we think that the arts have a role to play in social cohesion? And is Ubuntu possible? Lami. Good morning, everybody. Um, as I've been introduced, my name is Lami. I'm a, a crafter and self-taught visual artist. In my own words, I do believe that art has a huge role in uh, bringing together uh, social cohesion simply because um, when you go to a place and there's different people, different races and different backgrounds and religions, you get to, to take a bit of everything from everyone which allows us to learn um, different backgrounds from different people. Sometimes we don't get to understand certain things like for me personally I've never understood why Indians would burn um, stick that has smoke but then as more <laughs> I spent times with in my Indian friends I got to learn more about their culture 
and then if you if you incorporate like if you make a sculpture and incorporate different colors and different art designs from different um, races that for me it, when, when you look at that art piece it symbolizes unity so I do believe that art has a huge role in bringing social harmony and I do believe that it also starts with all of us as well in, in our homes. Great, thank you. So we have a yes, we believe it is possible. Good, yes. good, good. Mayashni, what do you think? Okay, so uh, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think it is um, hugely possible and I think we just need the right platforms in which to drive this uh, important statement. Uh, I think being a, an educator myself, I think uh, incorporating it into my syllabus daily, uh, teaching young kids uh, about social cohesion, obviously doing it via the arts in terms of theater, in terms of stage, um, and confidence building, um, breaking all barriers, be it language, be it uh, you know, um, uh, uh, cultural barriers, and putting it together, I think that is that is where I stand in terms of it. And in terms of Ubuntu, we look at respect, we look at um, um, you know compassion and fulfillment and all those things that come together. And I think the arts brings all of that together if we incorporate it in the proper manner by incorporating it in, into stage, be it uh, film. And I'm involved in film, so I am passionate about it. And I think uh, where I would like to direct it is that uh, we use comedy. Now, I, I'm a comedic actress, and I've played lead roles in comedy films, and I feel that we can do so much more by breaking the stereotypes of certain things. The movies that I've done uh, highlights different communities, the Indian communities, but highlights the different aspects of, um, of how we can all relate to certain things, how we are all so alike um, and we don't know it. And, you know, and we face the same issues um, that every um, you know, cultural group or ethnic group faces. And those are common things. And when we look at it and then we say, oh, yes, this is what happens in, in, you know, in my family or my home or in my cultural group as well. And uh, so, so we can do it, but in a fun way. And I find that through education, I can do so much more, um, highlighting so many things with my pupils. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like there's more to bind us together than separate us apart, so thank you. Carvin, anything to add to that? So uh, social cohesion um, is like a, a big, complicated word, but if I can tell you how my life has uh, intercepted social cohesion. Um, I was kind of forced into it um, growing up because my last name was Goldstone and uh, that's, that's usually a, a Jewish name <laughs> and I can see that are you looking at me like ooh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's because my family, my great grandfather was a Jew but he married a Zulu woman and so yeah. He wasn't eating the kosher meat. <laughs> and so uh, my mother's family came from, our family came from India um, on the cruise when it was landing. And so what happened was growing up, we would go as children to Phoenix where my mother's sisters lived because some of them were pure Indian <laughs> and then some of them were diluted. And so um, we'd have biryani and then my father would take us to see his family and then we'd go to rural KZN. And then I'd realize that, okay, on this side, we're Zulu. <laughs> so this is, this is interesting. And then as I got older, the Jewish community asked me um, if I can come to the shul <laughs> because uh, my name is enough to let me in the door because uh, they had goldstones there. And so social cohesion for me became learning different cultures and I found myself almost... Uh, without wanting to, forced into it. And so my experience from it has been having an understanding of different cultures makes you a better person. Don't be, don't be a cuck person. 
And social cohesion can make you a better person because, like you're saying, the more you understand different people, you, you're less likely to say something like cringy. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you said that. Just a quick example, where I live, I live in Hillcrest, and during the unrest, we had to have a community meeting, and there's not a lot of social cohesion in Hillcrest. It's very white. It's, white. it's the whitest of white places, of all whiteness in all whitedom everywhere. And one of the, in the meeting, there wasn't, there's most, and the one lady said, uh, so th can't we just block the people back in their township? And I was like, social cohesion would have helped us to not have this moment. Because everyone was feeling embarrassed on, on the hubby of, no! But that's what social cohesion does. It avoids cringy moments like that because you understand the dynamics of how other people live, how their families are structured, how, how they eat. Oh my gosh, I'll never eat with my hands. But you have to understand the culture of mashing the food in your hands tastes better. <laughs> Thank you. So social cohesion personified and one person looks like this. <laughs> Mayeshti brought up an interesting point just now. She was talking about the role of comedy and both um, Carvin and Mayeshti spend a lot of time doing comedy. So I was just wondering, as comedy and satire, does it have a role to play in sharing different worldview experiences in a non-threatening and maybe hugely effective way. I mean, if you think of Trevor Noah or Peter Dirk Ace, for example, and do we find that people are more receptive to the message if the message comes from a place of laughter? And how do we think comedy is a useful tool for social cohesion? Maeshna, you start. Um, okay, so, so I think um, through comedy we can conquer any barrier because I feel it's, it desensitizes us to so many things. And you can have like the most serious message, but if you do it in a comedy way, then everybody can laugh at each other and hit themselves over the back and, 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 and you know, uh, you, uh, uh, connect with the person next to them. So I feel comedy is, uh, has so, uh, such a vital role to play in breaking those barriers. Um, and Ella spoke about Trevor, and I love Trevor Noah. Like, he broke all barriers when it came to, to racist terms, and he used the K-word. And, like, it was okay because Trevor Noah said it, you know? And it was fine then, and everybody laughed about it. And then, we, and, and then if you look at um, Riyad Musa, he did the movie called Material, right? And this centered around... The, the whole Muslim community, and uh, we got to look at the society and learn about it. But we also got to learn vital things and also related to our society. So all of those things, in, my, in, in the movie that I've uh, worked on, uh, I got to showcase um, the, the chats with community and the area of chats with and people around the world got to see a slice of life of what the chats with life is all about, the Indian community the food, the culture the vibrancy of the people um, and, and the movies on Netflix so people around the world are now watching it and getting to see what we appreciate what our cultures are all about and it's exciting because now I am you know people mess are messaging me on Facebook and they're saying oh wow we've watched the film and they're from Sri Lanka or they're from Canada or Australia and it's exciting because they're getting to see a slice of life of what is happening in a little town in Durban in South Africa so it's it's you know there's 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 so many um, there's so many avenues that comedy can, can uh, debunk all of this, these, the, the stuff that we're using. <laughs> Go for recovery. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, the thing about comedy is comedy is a fit. You know when you laugh <laughs> and you're not supposed to laugh, you actually got no control over that. I, you hear something and you're like, oh, I shouldn't laugh at it. <laughs> and your, your body kind of reacts to it. So comedy is very disarming. It can disarm a, a, a conversation that's heated. And it comes from pain. It usually comes from pain. Uh, so 
people who tell stories, when they tell the stories, uh, they're funny, but when those stories were like happening, it was usually painful, like when my father was struck by lightning. <laughs> we, we were not laughing, but uh, when we thought about how he was falling, <laughs> it was then funny later. <laughs> Uh, he still doesn't find it funny, but that's fine. <laughs> he survived, as long as he survived. So comedy has this power to disarm what's like really a tense situation. And so in conversation and in understanding cultures, uh, comedy is a very useful tool. In, in, it can introduce you to a world that you've never thought of. Like, for example, I'm from Newlands East, which is a previously colored township. And a lot of people don't really know much about Newlands East, but I always tell them, Newlands East, we, we have a mall. And um, people say, well, we got malls. I'm like, yeah, but you must understand, we got a real mall. Like, we got ShopRite. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just ShopRite. But for us, it was a mall, because all we had before there was tuck shops. And when we had a big accident at our mall, and all the bricks fell, and the colored people started taking the bricks, and people didn't understand that. And I said, well, because we need bricks at home, because like if your uncle parks his car and he doesn't come inside for 20 minutes, you're like, why? He says, because where's the brick? The car's gonna roll. <laughs> <laughs> so, and or we use them as, as, we use them as door stoppers by the door. I don't know if any of you in your cultures use them, but you never know it's a brick because it's dressed up in an outfit, a frilly outfit. <laughs> And there's a lady that's making those outfits, <laughs> and she makes ones for the toilet seat too. Everything's dressed up in the house to go out, <laughs> even though it's not going anywhere. And these are things that uh, comedy allows you to interact with each other. Um, and yeah, and doilies, thank you. <laughs> As somebody who's also struck by lightning, I didn't find it remotely funny then, but I laugh quite at it now. <laughs> Lamy, in your CV, you mentioned that you were a future creators at the Batch Center, and this allowed you to embrace different cultures, religions, languages, and backgrounds. What did you learn from this, and how did it talk to you about social cohesion? All right, so having the opportunity to be part of the future creators at the Batch Center at a very young age. Um, okay, I went to an Indian school, so the only people that I was used to were Indians and their cultures and their, their chili bread, which I, I got to enjoy at the end of the day. But then when I got there, there were people from different places like Rwanda, Uganda, white people. And it was like, you know, when everybody's mixed and then everybody, there was never a point where maybe Ugandan only wants to speak a language with, the, with, with um, a Ugandan language only. So... I got to also learn other people's backgrounds and language, <coughs> sorry about that, and languages as well. And being there as well also allowed me to see other arts as well, other than craft, which I was, I was used to. I only knew craft. And then I saw that dance is also part of arts, which I didn't know. I knew the comedy now is part of arts. I learned a lot of things. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm such a nosy person. I would go there and watch and want to see what's happening because I'm now interested and I wanted to learn more. And with this, it, it allowed me to embrace other people, to respect them, instead of seeing someone having a lot of dots, like I've got my, my beads on and somebody else would look at me like, what, like what, what, and what is wrong with you? Why is she wearing beads? But if you do understand the significance of certain things in people's cultures, you turn to embrace and understand where everything, it com where everything comes from. For example, when I was part of the Courageous Woman, for me, that I thought that was just, you know, going to sit down with just a bunch of women having to talk and exchange words. But it was just more than that. I found that I found myself in other people's stories which is something that I, I've never thought that could happen. Like for today, I've taken so much from the both of you using comedy and some, some of the things that you guys have said, they're still playing in my mind. And when it also comes to disability, if you look at uh, most people, for me personally, when I saw a disabled person, I saw a person who's just disabled, like they can't do anything, whether it was eyesight or anything. But through this, I, like, now I believe that dis uh, arts is for everybody. It's not just for dis like people who are okay. Like, it doesn't matter where you come from, your age, your personal circumstances. 
their disabled people also have a right as well to, to have and explore this world of art. They also get a chance to also learn different backgrounds as well. Yeah. I think very often when we discuss issues around social cohesion, we default to presuming it involves language and race and culture. And I think very often we forget that social cohesion also means intergenerational and social cohesion also means including people with different abilities and different disabilities. So thank you for bringing up the thought about including people that have differing abilities because often that doesn't feature in conversations around social cohesion. Carvin, in your recent video about recovering from looting, you made some good points. You were talking about transferring positivity and the need to talk to each other more. And you suggested that some people are better able to bounce back from hardship while others battle. And how useful it would be for those that can bounce back easily to help strategize and support the others who are less able to. Do you want to explain on those ideas a bit more? Yes, yeah, so um, one of the challenges during the unrest uh, was how do, how do businesses move forward in a way that's more inclusive? So if you look at a lot of the businesses that were looted, like I'm from Newlands East, so I'm gonna speak from Newlands East. In Newlands East, Unilever built a massive factory. And uh, you know, there's also a class thing here. So you know, like when they start building the factory, colored people, we don't like, we don't ask what you guys are doing. <laughs> We, we, we just like let them say, hey, there's something happening there, and then like we just let them do it. Whereas like, you know, in a suburb like Hillcrest, as soon as they start digging, they'll be, what are you doing? What are you guys doing? <laughs> Who's in charge? <laughs> Can I speak to the, the manager here, please? I wanna know what's <laughs> going on here. <laughs> Stop <laughs> digging, put your spade down. <laughs> <laughs> Who gave you permission, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but in our communities, we speculate, hey, it's a mall. <laughs> No, I'm telling you it's a hospital. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> it's, a, I'm, it's a big discount. <laughs> and then when it's built, we realize, oh, it's a factory. <laughs> Go check if there's jobs there. <laughs> so Unilever built this massive factory in the middle of Newlands East. And uh, when the unrest happened, a lot, of, a lot of companies that built factories in the middle of communities or had communities... When they were building it, I'm not sure how much thought they put into the community that's around that, but a lot of those factories were looted and some of those people came from the surrounding communities. But like in Newlands, a lot of, and I only know this because Unilever approached me afterwards to say, can they do something? Because a lot of people from Newlands were trying to protect Unilever. And I said, that's so ironic <laughs> since none of them work there. <laughs> You've given none of them jobs. <laughs> so wow, <laughs> that they've come out to protect you. So, Going forward, we have to be more inclusive in how we build our economy. We have to think of where our business is built, who lives around us. And in South Africa, our, our, our economy has been structured from the beginning of, it, of time to be exclusive. And every now and then, people like us dip into it. We enter it. But we don't ever consider that there's hundreds of thousands in South Africa, there's millions who could not care if there's junk status? Like when they say, oh, we reach junk status, it means nothing. We're already in junk status. <laughs> so if the com country gets junk status, so what? We're already here. It does affect you later on. So going forward, we have to find those, and this is, this is a responsibility on those who are part of this exclusive economy, part of this exclusive society. The way it's structured now is not sustainable. What happened in Durban can happen again, as long as you've got people on the outside watching the rest of us live, mm, oh, look at them, mm, eating mug and bean. <laughs> as long as people are watching us live, this is not sustainable. So one of the ways, and this is what I was suggesting in the video, is that businesses that have been able to bounce back, look around them uh, and see smaller ones that struggle. And then when it comes to employment, don't look too far, look nearby. Let people feel invested. You know, and what's happening in South Africa is not unique to South Africa. In 2010, London, in England, burnt. There was fires across, there was riots, there was looting. 
And they couldn't understand how first world, the most first world country, was able to get to this point where people, Londoners, <laughs> were behaving like Durbanites, like, and, and they had everything. And they found that with, when they studied afterwards, they found there were so many young people living in London who had no investments in society. They didn't own a car, a house, they didn't have a job. So whether the place burnt or didn't burn, didn't, it didn't affect their lives. And as long as we're in that situation, we are still standing on this, on this cliff. And the way to go forward, I believe, is for a great inclusion of all people. Oh, this is South Africa for everyone. It has to feel that way. It has to be that practically. It can't just be word. We have to practically now, as business people, think, how do we spread? How do we share? Because South Africa is a rich country. There's enough wealth in this country. All we have to do is start thinking of how do we make sure that more people take part in it. Yeah. Good answer. And just one little sentence add-on. Do you think that notion of sharing and strategizing together in business would work in an arts context? So yes, I, I 100%, and I've been a proponent of it in my art form, which is comedy. So uh, I, used to, I used to run, just before the pandemic, for three years, something called the Next Comedy Generation, which sets up shows for people to come in, young people. And people, it's, it's a weird thing, because there is a scarcity mentality in art, where people think that if you're getting the job, that means I'm not going to get the gig. So I had all these young comedians, and, and I put my number out on Facebook, where if you want to try, contact me. I got the stage, I'll set it up. And I host the show, introduce, and I tell them that you're probably going to be bad, but they must laugh anyway. Because one day you'll be good. <laughs> but for now, <laughs> I'm preparing the audience so they, they're not shocked. Oh, this person's terrible. I told you it's going to be bad. <laughs> and so, in that way, you're spreading it. And some people just say to me, but aren't you worried now there's going to be more people in your space? I said, no, that's not how this works. <laughs> the, more, the more people are... are are introduced, exposed to this art form, the more interest there is going forward. One day when you're having a party, then you know what, I saw a comedian once. Let me have a comedian for my party. So like for example, use Trevor Noah. When Trevor Noah arrived, it was a confusing time for comedy because he didn't take a long time to take over, <laughs> if I can put it that way. It was like maybe like two years, which was, which was unusual. And, and people say, well, how do you guys, I was like, this is great. <laughs> like all of a sudden people think of comedy. They never thought of it before. Now they think of it as something. So I think sharing, like in art, doing away with the scarcity mentality, uh, sharing more opportunities with each other is the best way forward. It's the best foot forward for all of us. Because more gigs means everyone involved with art. Sound, lighting, staging, venues like the Playhouse. There's more opportunities for all these people. Thank you. And talking of sharing, let's share some more poetry. Farah Sayad is a student of poetry, a mother, and a gardener. She is the founder and director of The Lemon Tree, which is a relief project to gather funds towards community upliftment and environmental awareness, which she founded with her two children. And she's the curator of the Poetry People Project. She draws her creative inspiration from ancient arts, the matriarch and from observing Mother Earth's various layers of mind, body, and soul. And her motto is to love, to heal, to grow, and to live. Fora, do come to the microphone. Thank you. I'm going to read the first one, which is a, a new baby of mine. And it goes something like this. Thank you. <laughs> Through this verse, I ask for a sign to shift the words out of my twisted spine back into line the interconnectedness of time, where respect keeps the rhyme. I dismiss the voice, the urge to hold my breath. I catch the words from disappearing into my skin. Ya Um, O oh Mother, deliver me from within. 
so that when the message climbs out of my collarbone through this poem, I welcome peace back home. Ya um, ya bint, ya ard. O mother, child, O oath. In that moment, I asked for the message, and this is what I received. The neighbor brought flowers. My children called me by name, and the rain started to fall. Thank you. The second is an old piece. It's entitled Anthropocene. My nature is poetry. My poetry is nature. Together we embody an eternal anthology. The blank canvas birthing color with the sunrise butterflies. With the sunrise butterflies. In bursts of euphoria to cotton candy skies. My fingertips caress and connect to me of F.E. Now has become a time. Observe. Step one, two, three, four. Pause. In the garden, all are welcome to gather in growth. A musical matrix for seed and mud, planting enchantment into the air, into the earth, connecting to roots, dancing, dancing with trees like trees. We occupy the mind further, writing, singing in a restless fashion. Writing, singing in a restless fashion. Repeating ritual after ritual. Repeating ritual after ritual. The nature of poetry, the poetry of nature, never sleeps. Farah, thank you so much for those beautiful words and thank you for reminding us that in our discussion around social cohesion, we need to include our relationship with Mother Earth because without that, there's no hope anyway. So thank you very much for that. So a new thought. Art still tends to work in silos in South Africa. I'm generalizing, of course. But typically, say, let's think that young people respond to spoken word performance art. Maybe let's think that older white people respond to Western classical music. That Indian dance lovers love classical Indian dance. That Zulu audiences listen to Escata Mia, et cetera. So for the fabulous Kandasami franchise films, which humorously portray the South African Indian experience, it's probably watched by and large initially anyway by South African Indian audience, although of course the Netflix deal will probably shift that. So how do we start the conversation around cross-pollinating our audiences? Some art forms are better geared towards social cohesion than others. For example, jazz is so well geared for that. But how do I get Carvin to go to the Natal Philharmonic Orchestra? How do I get my nestry to go and watch some Zulu dancing? How can I get Lamy to go and watch a Bollywood movie? And I'm being facetious, of course. But just to make the point, should we cross-pollinate? And if so, how? And I want everybody to respond to that. Who's going first? Nestri? Calvin? Yeah, so... It is um, sometimes difficult because taste in art um, is determined by your environment that you grow up in. So uh, the way I grew up in, my son, uh, he's 12 now, but when he was 10, he wanted to go to Drakensburg Boys to sing. He can't sing, but it's another story. <laughs> so I said, okay, let's see if you can, and then he went, and then he came home, and he says, hey, Dad, I want to show you this song. And he says, and he puts on the song, Abura Pompi. And I said, what is this? He says, yeah, this is like, Abura Pompi. I was like, oh, my. I'm losing my child, yeah. 
So, um, the, the, the ability to like, enjoy Burupombi uh, was not like, immediate, but uh, um, after a while, yeah, I like, I like Burupombi. <laughs> I sometimes play it on my own when I'm by Confession myself. time. <laughs> and uh, what I'm saying is, sometimes it's, it's about creating that exposure, opening those channels um, to, like maybe some of the, the Kusfach uh, girls. <laughs> And boy, and boy. <laughs> Girls that are here um, ha have never considered spoken word poetry. I'm not sure maybe you guys have, but, but that might now be a new opening. So I, th I think institutions like the Playhouse have a, a, a great opportunity and play an important role uh, because they have the infrastructure to expose different communities to different art forms. And sometimes it might be like just pushing them in there. <laughs> So just go listen, guys. You're going to love Skatamiya because just sit here and just wait. Because uh, I was exposed to Skatamiya as, as an adult. And I was like, why, why was I never exposed to this as a child? Why was it so far from my world? Um, and so that exposure is probably the most important part. Uh, if you think of disenfranchised or underprivileged people across the world. And you think of, like, let's say, for example, someone like Tiger Woods uh, in, in, in America or Venus Williams, like the top tennis player, top golfer. And, and you think of traditional exposure of people of color, black people, to, to tennis <laughs> and golf. It's very low. Like, it, it's also very hard. Have you ever tried? Oh, my God, golf is not my... <laughs> right here, ball just landed. So exposure to those things, over time, produced one of the best golfers and one of the best tennis players of all time. And what I'm saying is, the next biggest Katamiya artist could come from Kusvach. <laughs> there you it's go, there's possible. a challenge. <laughs> it's very possible that the next big uh, star in Indian dance could come from uh, Kwamashu. And that exposure is where we have to um, really work. That makes sense, we have to really work cohesively. <laughs> yeah, see what I did there? Be conscious of it. Yes, mm. together. Yeah, it is, it is hard and it is one of, I think, our biggest challenges. So, Lamy, what do you think? How do we get out of our silos? I don't have to agree with you there that sometimes you just gotta force somebody to go with you. Well, it basically starts with our friends, um, people at, at home. I, I have a sister who absolutely had no idea what art is. Um, simply because they were not exposed to this world up until I used to drag her and let's go to the bed center, I'll pay for you for the taxi fees, I'll buy you food, come, let's, and le let's, can we just go? And then with time, she started saying, when are, when are we going to the bed center? So people are not interested in things that they do not know. They start n uh, being interested once they get a taste of something. So uh, one of the ideas that I would have is having pop-up events like, um, for example, if I say, okay, this week can we go have a pop-up event in Phoenix? There we can have maybe different artists from different backgrounds. We can have uh, comedians, uh, people who are going to dance, cultural dance. Over there you get to see and be exposed to, to different things. And then you can then start researching and um, offering those people with information as well. I think um, art on its own um, for some people, it is, for me personally, I feel like it's a, a slow, it, it is a growing industry, but I feel like it's, it's a slow growing industry whereby we can do more. Um, we have people who have talent sitting there and then look at this unrest. People are sitting at home, they don't have jobs, they do have a talent, but they don't know how to use it. They don't know how they can uh, start off and generate income with this. And you, you may find um, someone, I started something and I started generating money, I was like, wow. And I started teaching my, my, my sisters how to do this, because now I had so many people asking for orders from me, I feel like I generated um, jobs for them, I created jobs. So if you look at something like that, that was very, very small for me, but if I, 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 I sit down and think like, if I can do something big, I can create more jobs for people, I can um, show them that they, they, 
they don't need, sometimes we don't have money to go to universities and stuff, but we can use the arts to actually put bread on the table. And this can also avoid um, young teenagers falling into drugs, crime, you know, we can prevent them. Um, the holiday program that I was um, in at the bed center, it was a holiday program for we mostly had um, children from school. I was still a student as well, by, by the way, but I was all already a future creator. So we'd have different schools, different children from different backgrounds throughout the holiday. So if we can have such centers like in different communities, and then we can teach children how to maybe to, to do weaving, and beadwork, and then we can start selling, and anything that sells, we give them percentage of, of, of this, so that they can start being interested in this, and also wanting to do more as well. So like he mentioned earlier on, he said the more that we are, the, the greater the ideas. So if, you're, if I am alone, I, already, I, I only know my vision of what I want, but if I can take all of us here inside this room and we can create a campaign, we can come up with very, very good ideas and we can all incorporate it um, to get something out of it. So we can all, I think the pop-up events or also having art installations, like go to Guamash or somewhere and put up maybe some, a, a sculpture of an Indian woman or maybe like a, a certain sculpture that has like a different background. You know, some, sometimes you, you walk past something and then it's colorful, it's beautiful, it forces you to read. And then you would read that information and the minute you read it, you get knowledge from, from, like, from that sculpture. You don't need to actually go to someone and dig that knowledge out of them. Sometimes we as per people need to do our part to make sure that we get to, we reach as many people as we can, especially through arts as well. Good, so we're looking at exposure, we're looking at imparting skills, developing community, and sharing knowledge. Yes. Maestri, what else can we add to that? So I have to share. Coven spoke about his son and, you know, going into, uh, you know, um, choir and learning how to sing. And I have to say that that's how I started because I was um, enrolled at drama school and I started at the age of seven. And it was a new experience. But my dad, being an educator, said, you have to do this. I want my children to speak eloquently and confidence and all of that. So we went along and my brother and sister as well. And I absolutely loved it. And that's how the passion came about. And that's where I am today because I said, this is what I want to do. Um, and obviously it started off small, um, you know, going through grade one and two and all of those things. And that's where the passion started for me. My brother and sister on the other hand, Drama's not for me. Mm -mm. <laughs> we don't want to go. You're dragging us there. And, like, you know, we don't want to. But for me, I think that's where it started and that's where it is today. And that's, I always speak to my pupils about, uh, you know, not everyone can be an academic, you know. But look at wh where your talents lie in terms of what are you good at? What are you passionate about? Um, and I've incorporated it into my school syllabus where my pupils have so much of fun. I last year taught at a children's home and these children have uh, hectic backgrounds. They come from, you know, uh, damaged homes and they have, uh, you know, um, it's so much of emotional baggage. But when it came to doing theater pieces, they felt that they could let loose. It was their time to shine. They felt that they could express themselves so much during that time, and I got them to do fusion pieces. So they were doing gumbo dancing and fusing it with Bharatanatyam dancing. And they got to learn, um, you know, um, totally out of their comfort zones. They got to learn what is a stick dance, all right? It's uh, a kolatum, uh, the, the name given to it, and it's a stick dance. So my kids got to do this. And when they came up to me and they said, but ma'am, we absolutely love it. When's our next rehearsal? It's that sense of fulfillment that you are actually giving them some sense of hope, but bringing it in to um, the art forms, right? And these are the tools that I used in mine. And then 
when you look at your metric pupils that are doing drama, like their theme programs, give them, I don't know if you guys do have drama at school, but like when I look at the theme programs, I feel like you can focus on so many different things and you can bring in so many elements, your dance piece and your poetry piece and your prose and your play, and you can bring it all together in this mixed fusion. And I, and I, and I love telling my students this, and I have a big, um, you know, I had a big saying on my wall that said that, uh, you know, we, we call ourselves the rainbow nation, but I don't want to call ourselves the rainbow nation anymore because the rainbow has colors that are separated, but I want to be a mosaic. I want it to be fused together. I want it to be interwined with all of those colors. There mustn't be any separation. So I always tell them, use that, you know, and, um, you know, that analogy? analogy, it's not coming on, analogy, yeah, you know, sometimes that happens. <laughs> so, um, so, even to the educators, see, that happens, it happens, you know, and we stand there and you go, judge us, but uh, yeah, it happens. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, I use that with them and they tend to focus on those things. And I think, and even with, um, you know, you spoke about, uh, you know, um, having um, holiday classes and stuff. And I had my first acting uh, workshop last year and it was for uh, pupils from, um, young adults from disadvantaged communities and whatever coming together and sharing their passion and love for being on camera or, uh, you know, film and the film industry stage. And it was an absolute blast where I got to see so much of talent that we have around us. We just need the right platforms. We just need the right, um, um, what's it, programs that bring um, uh, uh, people together that have so much to offer. And I think you guys, um, you know, are the stepping stones of so many different things when you're sitting there right now and absorbing all of this information and thinking about your career moves and uh, where you'd like to go and co uh, social cohesion in terms of uh, your extracurricular activities. And I always advise my pupils on you know what, looking at other avenues where your talents lie. You may say, I am horrific at maths, and I was one of them. But I was a creative, you know, and I loved expressing myself, and I took part in every concert and every, um, you know, everything that was happening at school. Any concert, any uh, activity that was in front of the assembly, um, any day, youth day and woman's day and whatever and putting pieces together and that's what I was passionate about and that's where I find, I feel that we can do so much more if we have the right platforms. A passionate answer talking about passion. That was really, that was, that's worth a round of applause I think. <laughs> Thank you. It's interesting, hey, it's interesting when you start thinking about how to take down the silo. Once you start unpacking what it means to take down the silos, that there are some really great suggestions and some some thoughts which we can all quite actively work on together. So thinking of the changing society, our world has changed indescribably over the last few years. Lockdown and COVID has transformed the way we do things. With so much of our world happening now online and our attention span has shrunk, everybody is a self-confessed expert with strong opinions about everything and if anything, our online lives, I think, sometimes do great potential harm to our social cohesion efforts. We default to outrage and to stereotypes. I think sometimes we are now more polarized than we ever were before. I think now we are sometimes more polarized than we ever were before. So where does art fit into this? 
And how can we modify our online experiences to better serve the needs of art and social cohesion? Lamy, what do you think? Well, I think we can have online workshops. So this eliminates the, the excuse of, I don't have money to go there. You know, um, maybe we can have videos recorded instead of people using data, they can be able to, we can be able to share the videos amongst each other and then you can get information out of it. And then um, even online workshops as well, like being there active, asking questions, um, interacting with, with a person who's hosting that, the, the, the whole workshop as well. Um, I think that would help as well because social media is very, very, uh, it's, it is a very powerful platform. So by sharing something and asking your friends to share it, your sisters, it, it, it spreads the, 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 world, the word and it gets to as many people as possible. I hear you, I think that's so important. And also to, we're trying to minimize excuses for people not to do things. And if we can find an easier way for people to be consuming art, that obviously helps everybody concerned. So thank you for that. Reshni, what do you think about that? Our online world, how does arts fit in? I think when it comes to, in, in my line of work, I think um, Kevin and I will, will, will uh, relate to this in terms of what we've been doing in terms of um, stand-up comedy shows and, you know, everybody's going through um, the, the, the whole depression with COVID and uh, everything else, the pressures of unemployment and all of that. And I think we can find a link of doing these things um, on social media, being such a powerful uh, medium. And everybody's on social media. Everybody's sharing things. Everybody's watching things. And, and, and I, I look at it as one of the examples was like the Ju uh, Jerusalem dance. Like everybody was trying the Jerusalem dance and you had companies following it and schools doing it and everybody was doing it and, and it just got everybody together. You know, that feeling of Ubuntu and that feeling of togetherness because everybody wanted to get in on that. I think we, we have such powerful tools but we, we're not using it in the right, you know, uh, uh, in the right direction. And also, you know, now there's a... I don't know that everybody's on TikTok and everyone's making videos. <laughs> yeah, 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 TikTok, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I was looking at examples of this and we look at the, um, the song, the, the Jalebi song, right? Jalebi is a sweet meat, uh, sweet meats. And, and it was a song done by an Indian guy and then it was taken over by... Um, Jason Derulo, yeah, and he took on that, and it became a huge thing, and everyone's, everyone was doing the, uh, the Jalebi song. And I, like, I feel that it, there's so many powerful things in, in song and dance and in the media, but we just need the platforms to put it through. I don't know. Come the, the online platforms especially, yeah. especially now over COVID, I yeah. think. Yeah, totally. Thank you. That was, that was interesting. And you're right about both of those examples. We all, we, we, lots of nodding of heads straight away. Anything to add? Yeah. Um, it, it can be tiring as a content creator. Like, I, I made a lot of content during COVID. And there was periods where I was like, just like flat, like blank. Like people say, when you're putting out another video, I'm like, oh, <laughs> you're not paying. I'll put a 10 rand. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's also like it's a it's a it's it's like we're giving our art away for free um, online, and as and like you know if, if you like if you like the TikTok queen and you're just putting out videos that's fine, but like if you have to actually pay school fees for for, for the things that you do, and you're doing it for free online and after a while you start like you it was great <laughs> right under each comment put a ten rand. <laughs> So that was a challenge. I'm not going to be honest. Like, as much as online is a space for us to live, and to, it's also it's a difficult space for us to live um, as performers and artists because it's not easy to extract 
uh, money out of it. Um, so that's been a bit of a journey, um, trying to figure out how to get money out of, to also make it a, a like an, a, an art form that uh, entertains, keeps people happy, but also makes you live like, you know, because South Africa is a place you can be famous and broke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the rest of the world, but yeah, there's lots of famous people. Ooh, ooh. The bank is phoning them. <laughs> this is my phone ringing. <laughs> and it's and it's a hungry animal. I mean, you need if you do if you're if you're working online, you need to create stuff all, all the, time. the time. It's relentless. The beast is never like satisfied. It's like you're just throwing food. Ah, nah, nah. Just throw continuously. The machine just wants more and more stuff. Um, that being said, when stuff does go out there is a huge appreciation in general to especially content that's funny and, and like light-hearted, especially in a difficult time like this when people are passing away and there's been uh, like a lot of unrest, people actually appreciate a, a little joke here and there. And uh, like, let's say for example myself, I last put out a funny video maybe two weeks ago because I just don't have the, I don't have anything to say particularly. I, people are keep jabbing me. I'll say something. Yeah, but what does this one say about it? Main, naming a character. Like saying, put a video out. And like it's hard to always like, <laughs> hey, be ready for action. It's to not, be a comedy jukebox. Yeah, yeah, just to be like on, on point. And, and so that's the frustration as a performer. Um, you were talking about us being polarized. Well, that's the one benefit of online art is that it can, um, especially comedy, it can disarm difficult topics online. Uh, and sometimes as, as, as artists, when you start getting political or thinking you're clever, they're almost like, oh, just stick to the comedy, bruh. <laughs> like, shut up and dribble. <laughs> like, it's not, they don't want you to uh, get into that space too much because that's not what, why we follow you. We follow you for like, yeah, dang, like tell us a joke, yeah. <laughs> joke man. <laughs> tell us a joke. Um, there's, I think artists really battle to uh, find a new way of, of doing work online. And just one good example, there are lots of, as we've all mentioned, there's lots of interesting international examples, but not too many good local examples. And there's a Peter Maritzburg-based piano player called Christopher Digan, who early on in lockdown, he says, people are sitting at home alone and they're lonely, and let me entertain them. So from the first week of lockdown, every Wednesday and every Sunday, every week, he's done two online concerts for an hour from his lounge for free. And he says, look, please give me money. This is how I earn my living. You're welcome to donate some money. But Every, any Wednesday or, or Sunday, you, you hop online, Christopher Diagon Music Revival, and he'll do a light, entertaining music concert. And he's got three little dachshunds, three little sausage dogs, and they'll come in and, and you know, he'll talk to the dogs and the dogs will bark. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's, we're in his lounge and he's performing for us and he's very informally chatting to us. And I think trying to find the good examples of where our world, our performers have made it work online and to try and learn from that is a really useful thing. So talking of performers, Ewok. Ewok is an independent arts activist. He's a professional educator and educational philosopher. He's a performance theorist and practitioner. He's an entertainer and writer. He also works in um, theater, production, film production, music production, and aerosol art, writing, directing, and painting, and is a freelance educator. He's also the local coordinator of the Theater and Dance Alliance, ta-da, which is an increasingly important platform. Ewok, the microphone is yours. Uh, two pieces, yeah? Yeah. Cool. You got comedians up here. It's still such a serious room. You guys want to give them a little round of applause and a chuckle to say, well done for being up there, yeah? Yeah. It's tough. They used to laugh. Not stony silence. Well, I don't know. Sometimes, maybe some stony silence. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got two pieces today. And the reason I chose them is because of the distance between them. This first piece is from 2012 to talk about how the conversation hasn't really changed that much, or maybe it has. 
This one is from 2012. It's the last time I professionally competed with poetry in a poetry slam, and I created this piece in 2012 for that. <laughs> I could talk about pressure, but I want to talk about something else. I could talk about my nerves, about preparing my words, but I want to talk about something else. I could talk about the frustration of wanting to speak to, to speak for my nation, but then I would need 12 tongues. That's 11 old ones, and the 12th one would have to be young. I understand that with 11 I could manage, but I need a 12th tongue so I can speak my language. Because I'm sick of me. I'm sick of being broke, but still called Alani. So give me Afrikaans, of course, or even Hindi. I'm sick of the whole time never being happy with what's in me. I could talk about the lightness and brightness and, hey, the whiteness that comes with feeling guilty, but I want to talk about something else. I could talk about how stop and tumble, that's stumble, and how choosing between the two, that's a privilege, so stay humble. It's true, stay humble, it's true. Stay humble, it's true. And then I realized that stay and humble, that could be stumble too. So you stay strong, so to you I can stumble. I could talk about how sometimes it all starts to crumble, but I want to talk about something else. Offense, defense, attack. I could talk about all that. I could talk about words as weapons, as shields, about words opening wounds that might never heal. Battle rapping, tongue slapping, spitting fire, dropping bombs, letting off lyric like shots lick from guns that'll blow apart egos, blast apart whole flows, keep the competition on their toes. Yes, I could talk about your mama, but I want to talk about something else. Because I could talk about Still pants sagging since standard seven. Still don't know why. Just once I wanted to be like a bunch of older punks, teenage drunks, skateboarding on weekends, suburban street kids without the homelessness, but still with the hopelessness and fear at the size and the scope of this adult world that we wanted to set fire to. So these older kids that I aspired to got me trying to graph right, got me trying to act right, got me fighting what was white, so I'm developing a black site. Yeah, I could talk about spray cans and baggy pants and ignorance and innocence, about pockets fat, heavy with hip hop dreams so maybe it's tighten the belt stretch the seams or hey you could just sag the jeans i could talk about aiming for an afro but ending up a bald head never gonna be a dread so i write poems instead maybe for an extra hand clap i might even write a rap i could talk about all that but i want to talk about something else because i could talk about things still being so blindingly white that all we have is hindsight. I could talk about when my reflection becomes a projection of unjust power, the color of refined flour, baking the richest cake, making every bite we take sweet enough to sugarcoat all the sugar stuff. I could talk about when my reflection becomes a projection of historical injustice, of how fragile and how fractured trust is. If you want to bring in the machine gun, take it back to the musket. If you want to understand power, it helps to know what lust is. I could talk about when all the metal is rusted, when all the mirrors are busted, the only reflection will lie in another man's eye. I could talk about how I would be a racist, but I actually have such a low esteem of most white people. In fact, I'm pretty much sick of my whole species. I could talk about things being so bright white that understanding the frustration of over 50% of my nation is made difficult by the privilege of my pigmentation. I could talk about being sick of my species, about all that feces, but one day I want to be able to say that I talked about something else. <laughs> So that was 2012. That was the conversation in 2012. And then this was the conversation now. When I was approached by a local school who commissioned a piece because a primary school, there were racial tensions. And I'm thinking amongst the parents? No, amongst the kids at a primary school, racial tensions. Can you prepare an intervention, a poetic intervention? Mm. They're going to learn something. <laughs> so, <clears throat> When I close my eyes, you disappear. Even though I know it's more than likely you're still here, when I open up my eyes again, what do they see? Reveal you, another version of me. We keep rolling, 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 keep rolling, 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 rolling. My role here is clear, to roll with you, true. We roll together, we withstand the bad weather, whether or not the strength you have or haven't got, we are stronger when we roll together, true. Our role is to roll with the rules, but only if the rules are rolling, see? The situation is serious, and you have a role in it, to roll with it, but how do you roll if the rules are rolling? How do you roll with the rolling rules? How to roll with a rule? 
Don't hold it so hard in your hand that when it bangs, your arm breaks. Don't try to twist it, try to turn it, tie yourself too tightly to it. Don't make those mistakes. Those mistakes have already been made. Recognize that a rule is not a rock to be thrown around. A rule isn't rubber to be twisted around. A rule is round. It's made to roll on the ground because the ground is always shifting. So the role of the rules is to roll with it. And you have a role in it to roll with it. That's how you roll with the rolling rules. When I close my eyes, you disappear. Even though I know it's more than likely you're still here. When I open up my eyes again, what do they see? Reveal you, another version of me. Now, just like school, there's old and there's new, there's old rules and new rules, fake rules and true rules, me rules, you rules, their rules, our rules, why rules, how rules, fun rules, dumb rules, rules that shock rules, rules that numb rules, rules to swim by, rules to fly by, rules to live by, rules to die by. There's rules that the rulers rely on to rule. There's revolutionary rules that turn the rulers into fools. There's rules and there's rules and there's rules. That's how they roll. So how about we just focus on this one rule? I got this one rule behind my back that I'm holding, and it's glowing, golden. I got this one rule behind my back, it's golden. I'm holding just this one, just this one rule, just this one. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Ubuntu. I got a cool golden rule behind my back, and it's glowing like this, like a fist. But this is not a fist in your face. This is a fist up in space, up there. It's a fist in the air. This is a fist, a symbol of that cool, golden, glowing rule that we're holding. A symbol, when I hold it, I lift it erect. And another name for this symbol, for this rule? Respect. Now, let's reflect. Let's reflect. Let's reflect on this rule. Let's reflect on respect. Where do I look? What do I see? Look to see respect. Question, where do I look to see respect reflected? Question, look to see respect reflected. Question, well, where do I look to see reflection? Question, look at a mirror. Reflection respected. Respect reflection. Question, if I looked in the mirror, what would I see? Would I see respect reflected in me? Look to see. Question that reflection. How does a mirror work? A mirror works both ways. What you see is what you get. What you show is what you reflect. How does a mirror work? If you reflect on brass, you don't really see true. If you reflect on glass, you kind of see through. But if you reflect on a mirror, you clearly see you. That's how a mirror works. The mirror knows what the mirror shows. The mirror has no choice. So if you looking to be respected, thinking that we've perfected, correct respect in each and every aspect, detect the right dialect, collect respect, project the energy, protect the project, affect the intellect, connect, never neglect. The biggest benefits will be the next effect. You want to be the one that everyone else respecting and make sure respect is what the mirror is reflecting. Question, if I was the mirror and you were the reflection, Which one of us would you see respected? Question. If I look at you, but I see me, how hard can respect truly be? When I close my eyes, you disappear. Even though I know it's more than likely you're still here, when I open up my eyes again, what do they see reveal you, another version of me? The mirror knows what the mirror shows. You reflect on brass, You don't really see true. Reflect on glass, kind of see through. If you reflect on a mirror, you can clearly see you. The mirror has no choice. The mirror knows what the mirror shows. The mirror has no choice, but you do. So, you see me, and I'll see you. And together, we'll hold up this golden rule. Together, we'll both be holding what's golden. And with respect to the rules, we'll keep rolling. Wow. Thank you, Ewok, for reminding us the more things change, the more they stay the same. Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful words. We have 10 minutes left, and I'd like to ask for the mic to be cleaned, because now I want to turn the mic to you, and especially some of the young voices in the front. 
I want your thoughts and your questions. If you want to comment or observe anything that's gone before, by all means do. Or if you're wanting to ask a question to any of the panelists, by all means do. I'd like to ask you to come to the microphone, please, just so we can record this and also just have it as, as video as well. But to anybody who would like to participate, now's your moment. Please do. We'd love to hear from you. Team Kusvach. Ewok. I want to put this to the panelists because I don't want to feel like we're dancing around the topic. I don't think we are. I think you guys have all been really articulate. It's great to hear the opinions. I think it's been very positive as well. But I don't know how deep we've gone into the idea of why is it that we are not socially cohesive? What is it that is keeping us apart? Why is it safer to be in the silos? Because I think in that, there's some sort of unifying moments. There's something that we're all scared of that keeps us looking for the same and looking against or looking away from what's different. And I want to know from the panelists, why are we not cohesive? What is keeping us apart? There's a question. And a very good question too. Who wants to attempt to answer it? Go for it. Yeah. So, because of our, our upbringing, we all default to what we know. So, when you go to university, the, the first thing, what, what grade are you guys in? 11. So when you go study, the first thing that hits you when you get there uh, is that in my case, you come out of a school where everyone kind of looks the same and you enter this space where everyone's different. And the first thing people do is look for people that look like them and hang out with those people that look like them. And we do it everywhere. We do it in, in rooms. We do it uh, in, in a, a religious space or uh, if you go to a church. And one of, the, one of the challenges for that is that we are conditioned, even from our homes, to find safe spaces amongst people that are like us. And so the, our cohesiveness, we almost have to break through that barrier. We have to, it's, it's going to have to be a, uh, an action. It's going to have to be an active thing for us to reach out. And so African society has deep, entrenched divisions. Uh, our communities are structured in a way where we are, we grow up around people that look like us. Um, we surrounded our family, our neighbors, and those things are not easy to break. That's going to require an active move from all of us to step outside of our echo chamber. Because sometimes what happens is you live in a little echo chamber where you think this is what black people are like. Well, this is what colored people are like, because everyone in your echo chamber is saying that. And then you step out of it one and you realize, well, you know what? Not all colored people are drunk, <laughs> whatever, whatever your echo chamber is saying. <laughs> Some of them are, um, funny. yeah, funny. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that ability to, to step out is not something that's inherent. It's something that's active. It's something that we're going to have to continuously talk about. And I suppose a conversation like this is to spark it because some people don't even think about why do I ever need to step out of my... Because it's so comfortable here. Like, we all eat the same food in the space. Uh, and, you know, like, even within our cultures, like, people don't realize sometimes that... Uh, and I, this is... Mahesh Nihil because she does weddings. Like, a Hindi person marries a Tamil person. And everyone else, well, they're, aren't they all Indian? And they're like, ooh, no. <laughs> There's lots of little issues going on there in between those two little cultures. And even within your group, your parents will try force you not to even be cohesive <laughs> within Indian people. <laughs> Stick to Indian people. Leave the temples alone, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and those conditionings come from our home. They come from our society, from our, uh, our religious groups. We're going to have to actively, continuously hold conversations uh, where people feel like, okay, let me give it a try. Good answer. Raj, do you want to answer the question as well? Okay. Let's just see if any of the other panelists want to respond, and then it's over to you. Anybody else wants to talk on the theme? I would agree that it would be fear. I think fear gets the most out of us. So if you'd walk in a room as um, I'm dark in color and there's a lot of white people, I'd be so afraid to first interact. But it, it, it's all the teachings. So it starts with us at home. So I, I, I'm, I'm a mother. 
well, my son is fortunate enough to go to a school which is multiracial. There's white people, Indians, but, but I have other children at home who go to school where they're just mostly maybe black people or maybe white people. So it starts with, with me as a parent to, to teach you that white people don't bite or Indian don't, don't, won't, they won't do anything to you. They're just the same, we're all the same. We're just different, maybe, maybe your, our pigmentation may be different, but we st we're still all the same. So we, we as people, as communities, teachers, like how you incorporate everything into your schoolwork, we as people need to, to teach this at home so that when a child steps out of their comfort zone, they're able to interact with everybody of color and not be afraid of saying that maybe um, I'm a different color and I cannot interact with these people. And also the way that we receive other people as well also plays a role because if maybe a white person can come to a group of black people and we kind of make you feel uncomfortable, it will make that person be afraid to ever approaching other people, other races as well. So we as well need to play a role that if somebody of other color like approaches us, we need to make them feel comfortable as well so that they can be able to, to step out and interact with anyone without having the fear of being rejected. That's a great line, social cohesion, it starts with me. I think we should all have t-shirts made. So, so just one, one other thing. I think this also applies to uh, the invisible class lines that we have in our society where, where even kids that are less fortunate um, would feel uncomfortable in a, in a middle class setting or, or where people are quite wealthy and maybe the other way around. So if you've got like extremely rich friends, it's not just a race thing, right? Uh, there's no cohesion. Sometimes we battle to even like interact. And you know, that's also um, a home thing again, uh, where uh, some children think they're better <laughs> than others because they've been raised in a home. Like Iwak was talking about uh, a, a racial problem amongst primary school children. Mm. Um, well, that has to have a root somewhere. They didn't figure out at school that they're different. Um, they, came, they came from home with some of those ideas. And so I'm a parent, you, you know, we have to really start like, uh, also tempering the way we speak in our homes. Because sometimes we just, we just uh, home becomes a safe space to say the most racist things. Uh, and grandpa's always like that, so leave opa alone. He always just <laughs> talks like that. Uh, we, <laughs> we almost have to now start curtailing that because this is not stopping. Like, I mean, those kids were what? Probably like 10. I mean, that's a young, in 2020, 2021, to still have that uh, so deep-seated that you have to actually call someone to do a poem to help them come out of it. That's like deep, that's a deep problem that they're having at their school. Um, and I don't think it's, uh, that's isolated, actually. I, I think it might be far, like, actually across more schools, and that's, a lot of it is down to our homes. Good point, I think. Do you want to say a quick word before yeah, I call quick, on Raj? Yeah, quick one. Um, I, I, you know, we, we, we're in a safe bubble, and we don't want to venture out into uh, an unsafe territory, as um, um, Kevin said. Um, and, and me dealing with kids, I've just come from a class where I've got the whole lot of... Um, I, I'm not going to say the rainbow, but uh, my mosaic there in class. And I teach them. I teach them about accepting one another and not looking at it as if that is your Indian classmate or that is, you know, my friend who is um, Aluve is a black child in my class. We are all friends. We are all one. We are, and I think that it starts in your home, and it starts with our parents and how we were brought up, and and with so much that if we start at grassroots level, we can change the mindset of how our kids see things when we get to tertiary level and then into the work field where we don't find ourselves in groups of isolating ourselves, we break all those barriers and we um, then socialize on a level where every one of us is 
you know, on the same wavelength, the same mindset. Good point, and to avoid labeling each other. Dr. Raj Govinda, the microphone yours. Thank you. I was very, very inspired by this panel discussion here today. Every one of you have made such a remar re remarkable contribution to us working towards social cohesion. And yes, social cohesion is an end product. To have a socially cohesive society is our ultimate goal. What we do to reach that ultimate goal is things like this, where we need to have dialogue. We need to come and share ideas. We need to share our experiences Maheshni just mentioned now we have to accept one another. Now, sometimes people use the word tolerance. I hate that word because I should not tolerate you. I need to embrace you. I need to accept you for who you are. You are part of humanity. And South Africa, we live in such a diverse society. We have so many cultures, so many race groups, so many religions, so many linguistic groups. We, we are living in a very, very um, uh, difficult country. But if we make a concerted effort to learn to understand each other's cultures, etc., then we live in a socially cohesive society. Now, post 19, uh, after 1994, after the great miracle, our suburbs have changed complexion. People from the black Indian groups and so on have moved into so-called white areas, right? And, and we had great problems. Why? For example, the Zulu family moved into this white area. And remember, the Zulu have a specific culture. So this family, they started appeasing the ancestors and doing rituals to appease the ancestors. And one of the things in Zulu culture is to slaughter a goat or a cow to appease the ancestors. But the white neighbor phoned the SPCA, right, to say, there's cruelty to animals. My neighbor is partaking in some cruel deed to animals, and the SPCA rushed there. But if we went to that family, and we partook in that ritual process and learned to understand that they slaughtered that goat because they wanted to communicate to the ancestors. Same thing, we had so much of problems where people were burning the incense stick or the impepu, right? They were burning those things. And, and the neighbors were frustrated and they were not very happy with that, uh, with that ritual. But impepu also, as the smoke goes up, you are communicating with the ancestors. And, and in Hindu, Hindu culture, by burning an incense stick is not only for the odor, but it's also eliminating all bad vices, right? And to introduce something more. So there's so much that we got to learn. But we're so good, we, we would love to go for exchange programs to France, Britain, America, and so on. We need to have local exchange programs. We need to go and learn what it is to live in a township. You know, uh, when I was a geography teacher in my previous life, one of the things that we taught in geography is informal settlements. I took my students into an informal settlement to live the weekend in an informal settlement. It was the best experience for those students. They were treated so well and they learned to appreciate what it was to live in that informal settlement so that they can appreciate and understand the problems that are faced by those communities. We need to go. Dipavali is on the 4th of November this year. With all this racial incidents that we had in Phoenix, Chatsworth and so on, we make normally parcels of sweetmeats and we share amongst our own people. It is senseless sharing the sweetmeats to a family that's already having the sweetmeats, <laughs> right? What we should be doing is taking those parcels and going to our white, black, colored neighbors and saying, as part of our Hindu culture, we, 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 we embrace you and this is a parcel for you. We should be doing that. Raksha Bandhan is this weekend. Raksha Bandhan is where a brother, a sister ties a string for a brother to embrace that person, to say, you know what, this is friendship. 
what's wrong if we go and tie a string on our black brother, our neighbor that's black? Huh? We need to move out of this box. We are living in silos. And you know what's a silo? A silo is a long structure where they store grain in there. If you stay in that silo, you suffocate. We need to break those silos and we need to go and embrace each other. And it's dialogues like this that is crucial in taking South Africa so that we all learn. Yes, we have different cultures, Afrikaner culture, Indian culture. We have those things, yes. But we need to strive together to be South African. Thank you, Raj. And to be human again. Thanks. Thank you. And Raj, for the record, I'm always available to eat your family's sweetmeats. <laughs> thank you very much, audience. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, poets. Thank you for a joyous session. Thank you. Go well. Travel safe. Thank you.